Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Lefebvre and we've decided to mini launch Tobacco Factory TV just a little bit earlier than we planned. We thought we'd mark, commemorate and celebrate the life of the late Prince Philip. In many ways, my favourite royal. Straight talking, wicked sense of humour, incredibly hard working. He just seemed like an all-round great guy, really. And of course, the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme pulled all sorts of people together. But hey, what do I know? Let's talk to a couple of Bristol luminaries who will give us some unique insight into the man himself. So joining me, George Ferguson, the former mayor of Bristol, who happens to own the tobacco factory, but of course that's not why we have him on. And Peaches Golding, the Lord Lieutenant of Bristol, which means she's the Queen's representative of the country's greatest city. Um, let's start, uh, first of all, with you, uh, George, because I think that very few people go further back with their memories of Prince Philip than you do. Are we talking something like 60 odd years here, which I think is something of a record? We're talking 67 years or 66 <laughs> years, I think. It's when uh, my dad was the military secretary to the governor in Gibraltar and the relatively new Queen, and, and uh, it must have been about 1954, I think, and the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were doing a Commonwealth tour, and they called in at Gibraltar in, in Britannia. And um, I don't know whether they came out in Britannia, but they were on Britannia. And uh, my dad was taking them around the rock. And uh, we, my brother and I, were given the, the uh, pleasure of having tea with Princess Anne and uh, Prince Charles in the gardens and we played with them and hid in the rhododendron bushes playing um, sardines. <laughs> and uh, so my first memory of Duke of Edinburgh was him, he and the Queen turning up and uh, I was taught how to bow and um, they were like gods. Well, I, 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 the thing about it with, with Peaches, I, I, I'm going to quote you from a, a chat that we had some time ago. And you said that if you lose your roots, uh, Peaches, you really lose touch with yourself. And I, I, I think that that resonates a lot with Prince Philip because he had such a, a, a strange and lonely childhood in many ways, mental health issues with his mother isolated from his family at the age of eight. And that seemed to build the character that stayed with him for the rest of his life. He's always, he's always gone with the underdog and, and sided with the outsider because he was pretty much an outsider himself. Is that, is that, would that be a fair assessment, bearing in mind what you know of the man? I would look at it slightly differently. And I would say that adversity um, is overcome through resilience. And one of the things that he did learn, it appears, um, throughout his early life was there are certain things that help to build character. And we see that in the Duke of Edinburgh Awards because that is encouraging young people to gain some skills, to test themselves, to face fear on an expedition where they get lost and cold and they can't cook the food that they thought they might be able to. All of these things build character and resilience. And the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, by their success, having run not only in this country, but also 130 countries around the world, you know, it's, it's proven a great way to, again, help young people face adversity, help them be more prepared for the future. Terribly successful. Yeah. And I imagine it did come from his youth. Yeah, and I heard that he actually presented the equivalent of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards in Dublin, and they came and presented in Belfast, and that was sort of very much hands. In London, rather, that was a big, big hands across communities. And that's what the Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme is all about, amazing diversity and pulling cultures and creeds and, and class together. And when you talk about the elitism in some ways of, of, of monarchy, he was anything but. He was all about pulling everybody together, wasn't he? That's exactly right. And we see that right throughout his life. And it is the convening power that the royal family use so well. And I think you said it. It brings together people of all walks of life, different countries, different heritages. And again, if you look at the Duke of Edinburgh's life and you look at the Commonwealth, what transpired was colonies gained their independence, their freedom, 
And as free and equal countries, they all decided to join the Commonwealth. 54 nations, 54 nations spanning from the Caribbean to Africa to um, Asia. And they all come together and they look at the types of problems and issues that they share and that they can solve. So it was the Duke of Edinburgh who many, many years ago realized that climate change is affecting these countries. The marine environment and the quality of that environment is affecting people that live in these countries. And they can't be solved by a single country, but as a group of Commonwealth countries, they can lead the world. And that is exactly what we are seeing. It is the Duke of Edinburgh's um, legacy, as it were, that's helping to shape our world. And of course, it helped to influence not just the Prince of Wales, but also the Duke of Cambridge. So that environmental strand goes right through the royal family, convening, concern about the underdog, as you say, concern about the environment. And of course, you as uh, Lord Lieutenant of Bristol, you are the Queen's representative in this the greatest, of course, city in the United Kingdom. But what has been the mood this week, do you think, uh, with the, the death of Prince Philip? Because people, I, I, I suppose it's a sad truth, but people learn more about people almost after they die than, than, than the 99 years that the man was alive. But what sort of legacy for Bristol and beyond do you think that he has left? An incredible one. I Every time that I'm out or doing anything, I hear people talk to me about the time that they met the Duke of Edinburgh. In fact, yesterday when we had um, a service uh, commemorating his life at Bristol Cathedral, one of the men there in uniform came up to me and said, you know, I met the Duke of Edinburgh as a young cadet. Now he's a corporal in the army. He said, I remember it so very well. And my only sadness is I don't have any photographs of it because my parents and my friends weren't able to come and attend. And he's been searching for ever to find these, these photographs of that wonderful event some 20 years ago. There are many stories that come up, individuals that met him, individuals that wish they had. Um, the times when I have been... Uh, graced with his presence, shall we say. Um, lots of people are remembering very fondly memories of not just being in the Duke of Edinburgh awards scheme, but, you know, just having been on the sidewalk even when he passed by. Well, I, I know that you've, uh, you've met him, what, I think, three times in Bristol, a couple of times uh, at Buckingham Palace as well. It's a, it's a sad week, but also a, a great week to celebrate the life and the legacy. Um, I, I know you have to go, Peaches, and, and what I want to say is thank you so much for sharing uh, your thoughts with us today. It's been really, really great talking to you. So thanks for very much indeed for coming on the inaugural programme, really, or, or section of Tobacco Factory Television. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. And George, uh, you've got some incredible stories, which I, I blew my mind when I heard them, first of all. Uh, never mind playing in the rhododendron bushes with, with uh, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. But you met the prince on a couple of occasions. Tell us about the time when, I think it was the SS Great Britain, uh, that, that they were having a, a look round, but you ended up bumping into Prince Philip on his own in a meeting of minds. Tell us what happened on that particular day. He'd become very human in my mind by then uh, because I had met him a few times and uh, he, was, he was somebody you could, although there was always a separation with the royals, um, I felt he was somebody you could really engage with and talk at a similar level. And um, I suppose we both shared the uh, fault of <laughs> saying, speaking our minds sometimes. Anyway, he... Uh, <laughs> He was going around the harbour, being taken round by a grand party. And um, I was to wait for him at the underfall yard to show him round because we had done a, a plan of the underfall yard for its future. And uh, so I was waiting there for the party to come. And then I saw this figure striding towards me. And it was, it was the Duke of Edinburgh. And uh, so I said... Hello, Your Royal Highness. I don't know whether he recognised me from the previous times we've met. Anyway, and uh, I said, 
uh, but where are the others? He said, oh, well, they were so bloody slow. I thought I would just come on myself. <laughs> so immediately it drops all the sort of barriers and it makes conversation really easy. And I was able to start showing him round the others puffing along behind him. And uh, uh, I think we're a little bit embarrassed. I know that there's, uh, as well, well, obviously there, there are mayoral elections coming up in Bristol very soon as well. He had his own kind of comment, didn't he, on Bristol mayors, uh, and I stress the plurals, uh, when you bumped into him. Was that at Temple Meads, I think, was it? It was Temple Meads when he was coming down um, with the Queen, and uh, they, uh, we had a line-up at Temple Meads station. I think it was at the time when the um, president of Singapore was visiting Bristol. And, and uh, there was a line-up of us and the Lord Mayor and the then Lord Lieutenant and everything. And I actually know the Lord Lieutenant was going down the line with them. And uh, he'd been introduced to the Lord Mayor and then he came to me and I was introduced to the Mayor. And he said, why have you got two bloody mayors? And I, I said, uh, well... Well, one's, you know, one's the formal dressing up one and I'm the one to blame for, and he looked a bit puzzled. But I then had um, lunch with him afterwards, so I was able to give him a proper explanation. But he was always interrogating about everything. And, uh, and I think a lot of people have said that. He, he, was, um, he was fascinated and, uh, you know, would ask difficult questions, which I always rather enjoy. Yeah, I just wondered what he would think if he heard that there were actually three bloody mares, never mind two bloody mares or even one, but uh, no doubt he'd have a comment to make on that as well. <laughs> I wish George... we had three at the time and it would have been more fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that would have been the retort. Uh, likewise, thank you very much indeed, George, uh, for coming on the programme and, uh, and, and getting us kick-started with fantastic memories uh, of uh, Prince Philip. Thanks very much. And you can see more of the biggest interviews in the city and the country and who knows, perhaps the world right here on Tobacco Factory TV YouTube channel. The address is on your screen now. Hashtag Tobacco Factory TV. Until the next time, bye bye.